I had my own random thoughts about the ongoing Russia-Ukrainian war. I had zero ideas how it all began, except what was flashing on my computer screen. These Ukrainian troops are still holding off Russian forces. The breaking news around the world was Russia has invaded Ukraine. The UN appealed to its members to pick a side, citing you either for democracy, peace and prosperity, or for war. I watched the dad tribe in the US go away from... Why in the world are the unvaccinated being treated differently than the vaccinated? ...to America versus Russia in a single instance. I want that, want that, I need that, need that. That's real homie, I can't believe that. At the recent Munich Security Council meeting, former Microsoft CEO Bill Gates unwittingly gave a win to the unvaxxed when he said, You know, sadly, the virus itself, particularly the variant called Omicron, is a type of vaccine. That is, it creates both B cell and T cell immunity. And it's done a better job of getting out to the world population uh, than we have with vaccines. And that had me wondering what the vaccine mandates were for in the first place. Mr. Gates' words were right on the heels of the news reports from the previous day about the CDC not publishing a large portion of the COVID data it gathers. Quoting this New York Times article, the performance of vaccines and boosters, particularly in younger adults, is among the most glaring omissions in data the CDC has made public. The agency has been reluctant to make those figures public because they might be misinterpreted as the vaccines being ineffective. Just when the bureaucratic foul play for the handling of the pandemic was being exposed, the perfect opportunity for misdirection presented itself. Frankly, the Freedom Convoys haven't had any coverage ever since the threat of war loomed on the horizon. Every conversation about the Russo-Ukrainian war has been about demonstrating whose side you're on. So whose side are you on? We'll begin by looking at what former US President Donald Trump had to say. I said, this is genius. Putin declares a big portion of Ukraine as independent. Oh, that's wonderful. How smart is that? And he's going to go in and be a peacekeeper. While I don't find anything particularly wrong with the statement, his words have been picked apart by those who have always bought into the theory of Trump being a Russian agent. Current U.S. president hadn't really known what to do with the tensions mounting between Moscow and Kiev as 2021 drew to a close. With regard to Ukraine, he announced on December 8th that he would not use U.S. troops to repel a Russian invasion force, forgetting the United States in the December 1994 Budapest Memorandum guaranteed Ukraine's sovereignty. In short, he gave Vladimir Putin a green light to commit another act of aggression. Here's another op-ed by the Washington Post. President Joe Biden finally acknowledged that this is the beginning of a Russian invasion after forcing the administration into an uneasy dilemma about whether that constituted an invasion by initially calling it a minor incursion. This was largely because Russian troops moving into Donbass was not in itself a new step. Russia has had forces in the Donbass for the past eight years. Two days later, Biden showed more decisiveness in the press briefing from the White House East Room as he said that the Russian military has began a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine without provocation, without justification, without necessity. This is a premeditated attack. Vladimir Putin has been planning this for months, as we've been saying all along. Let's also have a look at an interview here hosted by ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Senator Khan, thank you for joining us. The highlight of the interview was that his guest, Republican Tom Cotton, refused four times to condemn Trump on Ukraine. Are you prepared to condemn that kind of rhetoric from the leader of your party? Cotton was happy to condemn Putin and praise Ukrainian bravery and to criticize US allies in Europe. But Stephanopoulos just couldn't get over the fact that Trump was calling Putin smart and savvy. 
and saying NATO and the U.S. are dumb. But I simply don't understand why you can't condemn his praise of Vladimir Putin. Whether Cotton was willing to break ranks with Trump by condemning that kind of rhetoric became the focal point of the entire interview. George, you've heard what I have to say about Vladimir Putin. While there seems to be an expectation for Donald Trump to suffer political consequences for what has been misconstrued for embracing Putin, the majority of Americans think otherwise. According to a recent survey, 62% of voters say Putin wouldn't have invaded Ukraine if Trump were president. When looking strictly at the answers of Democrats and Republicans, 85% of Republicans and 38% of Democrats answered this way. And you can see how it reflects on the Biden administration to have voters on both sides of the political divide rallying behind Trump. This is how the narrative on the current crisis in Ukraine has become about the Trumps and the Putins of this world versus America. That's the reason you're being goaded yet again to blindly side with Washington. The truth is far more complicated than we are willing to conceive. It is far more nuanced than the official narrative. We are all coming from a pandemic and we all know how the bureaucracies of the world have done their absolute best to keep us in the dark. Here's my opinion and I'll refer you to the Avengers Infinity War. There's a reason the movie was a hit. So Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk and the rest of the Avengers unite to battle their most powerful enemy yet, the evil Thanos. On a mission to collect all six infinity stones, Thanos plans to use the artifacts to inflict his twisted will on reality. This is how the inference for Putin as an evil savvy genius comes about. You can be mad at how weak he has shown America and the West to be, while still acknowledging what makes him so formidable an opponent. This doesn't make you unpatriotic or a Russian bot. It means you can see all the pieces on the chessboard. What does this mean for our current geopolitical crisis? If the Western allies would be willing to examine their relations with Russia over the past few decades, they would clearly see how they have directly contributed to the state of mind Putin is in. Instead of following in the footsteps of Captain America and Iron Man, NATO won't reach deep into the past to see its complicity in the Russo-Ukrainian war. And this is where my criticism lies. So let's look at what Putin's concerns are. I am inevitable. NATO's advancement eastward. NATO is the transatlantic military alliance founded in 1949 specifically to counter the Soviet empire in Europe. After the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, out of the ashes rose Eastern European nations and Russia. The Russians considered it to be a sign of goodwill between former rivals if NATO observed Eastern Europe as a boundary between them. We believe that the eastward expansion of NATO is a mistake and a serious one at that. Boris Yeltsin, Russia's first post-Soviet president, told reporters at a 1997 news conference with US President Bill Clinton in Helsinki, where the two signed a statement on arms control. Indeed, the declassified documents maintained by the National Security Archive of George Washington University in Washington, D.C. show a pattern of promises U.S. negotiators made to their Russian counterparts as well as internal policy discussions opposing NATO expansion to Eastern Europe. In the current environment, it is not in the best interest of NATO or the U.S. that Eastern European states be granted full NATO membership and its security guarantees. This is according to a State Department memorandum in 1990, while those states were still emerging from Soviet control as the Warsaw Pact disintegrated. We do not, in any case, wish to organize an anti-Soviet coalition whose frontier is a Soviet border. Such a coalition would be perceived very negatively by the Soviets. 
While that was clear throughout the 90s between both nuclear powers, today NATO dismisses Putin's sense of encirclement, given Russia's massive size that extends to the Pacific Ocean, even though the vast majority of the Russian population lives in the country's European side. US-funded bioweapons labs in Ukraine. Now, there are Biosafety Level 2 labs in Kiev and Odessa, the two cities which have been the target of the Russian troops. The reason is they are said to be in partnership with the US. Now, there are a flurry of articles debunking this, but I didn't read them all. The few that I did make it clear that the biolabs aren't a work of fiction. They exist. It is the function of the labs that is in question, and it can be answered whichever way depending on who you ask. But just at the tail end of a pandemic, there is no reason why the greater weight is on there being something nefarious going on away from the public eye. It could very well be that Putin has his finger on it. And even if there is nothing to see there, a more pressing question would be why the US keeps funding experimental endeavors it has banned on its own soil in far-flung countries, especially so close to its geopolitical rivals. There have been reports of foreign students not being allowed on trains. In these hard times, I just hope it doesn't matter who's Indian, who's Pakistani, Russian, Ukrainian. So I guess in these hard times, we should just help each other. And there are some reports of foreigners um, being discriminated against, in particular um, uh, African students, being taken off the train um, to uh, make place for Ukrainian nationals of them being sent back to the end of the line. Now, this is something that hasn't gotten mainstream attention, but has been going on for a while. The ethnic tensions between the Ukrainians and the Russian minority. Western specialists have been too ready to depict Ukraine as a model of ethnic harmony, despite solid evidence of widespread ethnic conflict in post-Soviet Ukraine. Drawing from the witness accounts of asylum seekers from Ukraine in the first decade of independence, most described losing their jobs because of their ethnicity and being attacked and beaten by gangs of men shouting nationalist slogans while police ignored their request for assistance. Drawing on demographic data and on the witness affidavits from refugees who left Ukraine and requested asylum in the United States, Canada and Australia, it can be argued that the first decade of Ukrainian independence corresponded with widespread and serious harassment of Ukraine's religious ethnic minorities. Economic crisis in post-Soviet Ukraine bred scapegoating and marginalizing towards Ukraine's minorities. Census data indicates that Ukraine's population has declined by nearly 7% or 3.4 million in the first decade of independence, with dramatic declines observed among ethnic Russians and Jews. Drawing from the official data of U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service, it can be noted that there were more emigrants from Ukraine in the first decade following the dissolution of the Soviet Union than from any other former Soviet Republic. Ukraine accounted for nearly a third of all post-Soviet emigrants to the United States from the former Soviet Union. What is most alarming is that few Ukrainian refugees relied on family ties to emigrate to America. More than 80% of Ukrainian emigrants entered the United States seeking asylum from ethnic or religious persecution in Ukraine. Between 1992 and 2001, almost half a million former Soviet citizens emigrated to the United States. Of these, 31% were from Ukraine a majority of whom left Ukraine as bona fide victims of persecution. While the West has the data, they have done nothing with it. They stick with the narrative of the flourishing democracy outside Russia's borders. Putin sees the reality and often moves in to alleviate the ongoing persecution of Russians and Jews. The US skirts international law whenever it suits its purpose. For instance, the U.S. aids in the capture and the arrest of war criminals to be prosecuted by the ICC, 
while posturing as willing to do anything to protect American citizens from being subjected to it, including sanctioning ICC prosecutors and banning them from entering the US and also raiding the ICC courts to rescue any American in their holdings. Considering all the wars America has been in, I see why it feels so strongly about it. How can the US therefore be an agent of international law, which it so flagrantly scouts whenever it contradicts with its national interests? How would you expect, seeing all of this, Putin would respond to any geopolitical alignment that is a threat to Russia? Why does the US get to develop global missile defenses and deploy its elements in various regions of the world, but other world powers can't? The transatlantic military industrial complex profiting from wars. Over the years, US military expenditure has continuously hit record highs while the country's fiscal deficit worsened, behind which lies the strong influence of the country's military industrial complex. Throughout the US history, its military industrial complex, a highly interest group, has repeatedly manipulated the country's political decision making and seen wars as a shortcut to profits, prompting the US government to cause one catastrophe after another in the world. All of this without incurring the indignation of the international community or even being held to account. Something that Russia and China constantly bring up, but the West has always dismissed it and moved on to other things like targeting Russia and China. Now you tell me, are these the demands of an unhinged man? These are negligible concessions NATO would have made that would have decapitated Putin's aggression. I mean, really, if our world leaders cared about Ukrainian lives, they should have demonstrated it by doing whatever it takes to not add fuel to the political tensions and the ethnic rivalry that has been going on in that part of the world. The people weary of American military adventurism and those arced by Putin's actions should be one and the same. Unfortunately, most of the media and the public has been goaded into binary reasoning to keep the reins on the popular narrative of the Russo-Ukrainian war. You're either for us or for Putin. Speaking out against the precedent of meaningless wars created by Western powers in our generation doesn't mean that Putin is in the moment absolved. Both thoughts are harmonious, but once you force binaries into it, you fall right into some cultish allegiance. And for some reason, those in power want you to blindly follow. Because if you do, they will never really be held accountable for anything. And they can keep doing this one crisis to the next, one crisis to the next, while never really being held accountable. So I conclude by saying that America and Russia are both heads of the same dragon. Their breath destroys everything in their path. One head does it more often than the other, but I'd be mad to pick either side of what is essentially the same beast. I've been your host, Twips. It's been good having you here with me. So before I sign out, make sure you head over to our channel page to get caught up on all the content we've put out so far. Smash the like, leave a comment, hit the bell, share and subscribe. Help your boy to grow, help the channel to grow. Be safe out there, I'll catch you in the next one. I want that, want that, I need that, need that. That's real homie, I can't believe that.